Welcome, LGM Podcast viewers. Uh, I'm Bob Farley, of course, uh, and with me today is uh, Professor Brian Furry of uh, the University of Kentucky um, School of Law. College, 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 college of Law. College. I have to get these, um, these uh, jurisdictional uh, aspects right. Um, so. Brian is with me because uh, he is also the producer of a film which has gained uh, a lot of recent attention, even though it hasn't been formally released yet. Um, or at least hasn't doesn't have full distribution yet. Oh, no. It's coming out on the 30th, right? Right. It, the theatrical release will be on the 30th, 30th of August. Um, so the film was uh, purchased, licensed by CNN for, um, for television broadcast. Uh, and so they had the first window, which began on August 1st and ran for 10 days. And then Cynodyne is the theatrical distributor among basically everything else. Uh, they they purchased the rights or they licensed the film with respect to pretty much everything else or rather the contract pretty much all the other rights. So they're going to be releasing it theatrically. Uh, then there will be a second CNN window, like a seven-day window, I think, in November, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then Cynodyne will be doing the DVD, Netflix, or you know, some other kind of VOD-type uh, distribution as well. And so they're, they're currently putting together the theatrical run. I know they're, the film will be opening in several cities in the States, uh, as well as several cities across Canada. We actually have a Canadian distributor, apparently, as well, which I just learned about late last night. Um, and uh, they look to be doing a great job because there's already quite a few dates scheduled for Canada as well. And then we also have an international sales agent who is doing effectively distribution internationally. So it'll be showing on uh, various European Israeli TV and various other places you know, in, the coming, in the coming months. So, you know, which is um, so the the name of the film, which I don't think we actually said, is Our Nixon. Our Nixon. Um, and uh, what's interesting about the distribution we just talked about is how um, sort of its release is, and I don't know how much you plan this out, but it's coinciding with the forty years ago events of the Nixon presidency. I mean, it's. I wonder if wonder is CNN like interested in a particular ten day window or seven day window to be able to compare with something that happened it was exactly a, forty years ago. Or? It was a happy coincidence, I think, that the completion of the film coincided with the fortieth anniversary of Watergate slash slash the hearings slash the resignation. Um, which obviously we're trying to capitalize on publicity-wise as much as possible. And I imagine that to some extent, sort of people reflecting on Nixon 40 years later has helped in terms of raising the visibility of the film. But ultimately, we released the film when it was done. <laughs> you know, you can't sit on it. Uh, we certainly didn't have that luxury, you know, that, that we had to sell as quickly as, as possible. So, you know, it's just, it's just a lucky accident that, you know, I think people are, are thinking about Nixon's on the mind. Although, you know, I mean, realistically, I think people are always kind of interested in some ways. In well, he remains a, um, a fruitful subject, right? Yes. I think that um, a, a lot of um, lawyers, Spence and Mice, uh, a lot of viewers of the podcast probably also follow um, Jonathan Bernstein's blog, which is just a plain blog, and he does a feature, uh, a regular feature, which is 40 years ago in Watergate. So, um, will highlight actually many of the same conversations that are depicted um, in the latter portion mm -hmm. of the film. Right? The film is not specifically about Watergate, but of course, uh, you know, Ben Stein, notwithstanding, cannot avoid some discussion yeah. of the, the Watergate yeah. element of the Nixon yeah. presidency. No, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, when we first started making the movie, um, being kind of cussed, mm -hmm. experimental filmmaker types, uh, we wanted to make the first ever Nixon movie post-presidency that never mentioned Watergate uh, and did produce a cut that very early cut that did not mention Watergate at all uh, but 
unfortunately found that that just didn't really work. Um, it's kind of story-wise and in terms of what we realized the film needed to be able to do. I mean, essentially, the, the movie uh, is you know based on the home movies of Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin, who were Nixon staff members. They shot about 25 hours of home movies while they were working for President Nixon. And no, I, actually, I wanted to, you, you reference very early on. I think it's Dan Rather, a uh, Dan Rather voiceover, yeah. talking about Haldeman and, and sort of mentioning uh, as as one of his central hobbies, which is always taking film on the Super 8 camera. Yeah, well, we we try to work that in as a sort of um, thematic element in the movie because mm -hmm. we found in a lot of early test screenings that you know because the movie is one hundred percent archival, I meaning we didn't shoot any material for the film ourselves. Everything was. Mm -hmm from the kind of primary source record, it was material that we had previously. Uh, it's visually, I think, complicated, mm -hmm. uh, more so than a lot of uh, kinds of films, especially the general kind of television audiences are used to. And so we found that we really needed to provide people with a lot of cues as to how to read different material. And so one way that we did that was to work in references to the home movie making to remind people that a certain um, part of the imagery that they were seeing was in fact home movies and to sort of remind them to distinguish different kinds of visual sources from each other. And, and I was just saying, it kind of played into our, you know, our realization ultimately that the movie wasn't going to be about Nixon directly, but it was going to be about Nixon as seen through his relationship to his staff members, so kind of Nixon through the eyes of Haldeman or like and Chapin as best as we could sort of capture their voices and their experiences in in the film. And, and, and I think you know it's it's interesting, especially to the extent you know, people say uh, you 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 can learn a lot about a person from the way they talk to the waiter, mm -hmm. um, and I think you can learn a lot about the pre about a president from the way they talk to their staff members. And and I want to get back to this in a, in a, in a little bit, because I do want to talk about the production parts, but um, these were not simply hired guns, right, in the sense that, for example, we recently talked about uh, Senator McConnell in Kentucky and his hired guns, but they, and it felt like especially Haldeman, but they had a genuine affection and a strong affection. Oh, for yeah. Nixon, right? I mean, they really believed. Um, and that actually comes through, I think, better than you find in any of the transcript discussions or even sort of the voiceovers um, of the tapes, is that they really believed in Nixon and they yeah. believed in the role he was playing in the United yeah. States. Yeah, I'm glad you say that because it, it's actually something that we worked really hard to try to capture. And it was difficult for reasons I'll, I'll talk about in just a sec. But I, I just thought for the benefit of the audience, you know, I mentioned, that, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, these people, well, they were all. Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin each had his own, each of them had his own sort of relationship to the president and to each other. So um, Haldeman actually had been, he was an ad executive by profession, but had basically dedicated his life to Richard Nixon. So uh, the story goes uh, that Haldeman actually tried to vol the first time he tried to volunteer for Nixon was actually at the building where Nixon was taping the checkers speech as Eisenhower's vice president. And this was in 53, so how old yeah. was Haldeman uh, at that point? He was, he, was very, he was young then, and he was actually young even yeah. when Nixon came to office. I believe he was, if I'm not mistaken, he was 47 when Nixon took office in 68. I could be wrong. I don't remember his exact age, but it's about that. Um, so anyway, Haldeman had worked for Nixon for many, many years. You know, his first presidential campaign, I believe he worked on the gubernatorial campaign in California. Uh, he was around Nixon all the time and really was deeply committed to, to Nixon. Um, and went on to sort of define a lot of these kind of modern chief of staff role. He was Nixon for the first president to have a dedicated chief of staff in the way that we expect to see today. Um, Ehrlichman was a college friend of Haldeman's and did not have a long political career. Uh, and he sort of went on the Nixon campaign in 68 
with uh, Haldeman at, at Haldeman's request and became a part of the Nixon administration because of his role in the uh, campaign, uh, starting as uh, White House counsel and then moving into the chief advisor for domestic policy, uh, and actually was sort of an ardent environmentalist, so you know, it was really driving force behind a lot of you know, policy. Yeah, you know, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Earth Day, right. you know, really a lot, a lot of stuff that was kind of a big deal, um, and it's kind of forgotten that these were among many of the um, kind of more liberal in the traditional sense uh, policies of the, the Nixon administration instituted that remain today. Um, and then Chapin worked at the ad agency with Haldeman and started working for the Nixon campaign relatively early. And he was very young. He was were 27 years old. Were they all California people? Haldeman... Haldeman was from California. I believe he lived in Los Angeles. Ehrlichman went to college with Haldeman at USC, but ultimately moved to Seattle. So Ehrlichman was a lawyer in Seattle at the time. He was a land use lawyer at the time that he went to, to campaign for, for Nixon. Chapin, I believe he was originally from California. He went to USC as well, and he knew Haldeman through USC. So I'm, I believe that he was from California originally, but I'm not 100 percent sure. He currently lives in Long Island. He's the only one of the three who's who's right. still alive. But he was the youngest at the time. He was he was 27 when Nixon took, took, took office, and he was, uh, you know, special advisor, was it special assistant to the president. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe he was he was in various roles, but ultimately the last job he had was, was basically keeping the appointment the the presidential kind of appointments calendar. Um, so you uh, told me earlier that you had initially, you and your, um, your um, co-producer, co-collaborator, yeah. um, had initially... Yeah, she was a director. Had but director. Had, yeah. um, had um, initially hoped to produce the entire film simply from the Super 8 with the, um, with the, the, the tapes playing over for, as the audio accompaniment. Um, but that didn't work out because it didn't... Yeah, you know, the, the, the initial idea, so basically what happened was um, I heard about the existence of these Super 8 films uh, almost t about 12 years ago uh, from a friend of mine who was doing the preservation for the National Archives. He was making copies of them, basically, to a 16 millimeter film for, for preservation purposes. Uh, and I was really interested in them, especially because I was just interested in, in amateur film in general. Uh, but didn't have the resources at the time to really get copies of them or do anything with them. So I saw a little bit, my friend showed me like one reel, and I was like, wow, this is really cool, I wish I could get this stuff, but it's just not realistic. Uh, many years later, I uh, met Penny and we got to talk about it, and we decided that, well, we're going to just commit to pay to get this material so we can see what it is, and hopefully, cross our fingers, there's going to be a movie in there, it costs about $18,000 mm -hmm. to make the initial video transfer. So we got this collection of like 25 hours of film with really no meaningful idea of what was going to be on there um, or what it was really going to look like. You can see a little tiny bit, but not enough to really get a sense of the full collection. Um, so we spent some time just watching it and then started trying to piece a film together out of the material, uh, which was really a, a kind of a trial and error. Process. And so, you know, like you say, the initial cut consisted only of Super 8 film, and we were trying to pair that with the secret tapes in order to kind of create this kind of intimate perspective on the president. The problem was that the Super 8 films are weirdly anonymous at the same time as being very personal because there's no context. Right. You don't really know what's happening. You don't really know what you're seeing. And they don't choose to film the kinds of pivotal events that you need in order to kind of structure a story that people are going to be able, be able to engage with. The problem with these secret tapes is that they're so intimate and so specific and context-free that without a lot of framing, you have no idea what they're talking about. 
you have to place it at a particular period in time and understand what's happening around them. They're not setting the stage by saying, and now we're going to talk about how we feel about the Ellsberg. You know, they're they're just like, motherfucker, you know? <laughs> that son of a bitch, what, what the hell do you think he's doing? You know, if you don't know who they're talking about, it's, it's, it's impossible to make heads or tails of it. So we, real, we realized pretty early on um, that it was going to need something more in order to engage with a more general audience. And so that's where, I mean, you have a lot of archival news material, um, yeah. you have a lot of um, sort of later interviews with the principals. That's right, um, that's right. Yeah, which so through the, the Nixon Library, some of it, right? A lot of it through the Nixon Library, some through like C-SPAN. It was a real, I mean, there were it was a, a huge range of different archives and libraries that we drew on in making the movie and a big part of the project was sourcing all the material that we use. And the archives are very dispersed, mm -hmm. uh, the collections can be you know, hard to track down, you never know who's going to have what sometimes. It can be, there's a lot of hunting around to find the things that you need to work with. And so you know, ultimately, yeah, you're right, the, the film kind of, I would say it roughly breaks down to kind of three categories of material. So there's the Super 8 films, which are all in, in color, and they're all home movies. Uh, there's the TV news footage, which we made the aesthetic decision to frame somewhat smaller and to put into black and white. Again, as a kind of a visual way of cueing audiences into what it was that they were seeing. So you use, you use, to my recollection, you use mostly Cronkite, right? You use there's a lot of Cronkite, but there's also um, you know Dan Rather's in it a few times. Um, I believe. Well, shows. And there's a few other people who show up now and again. Mike Wallace does some of the interviews. Um, uh, Ludovic Kennedy does some. Phil Donahue interviews right. Haldeman at the beginning of the film. Actually, the last time we watched it, it spurred us. It spurred myself and uh, my wife to look up and see if Phil Donahue was still alive, which he is. He is. Um, he is. Yeah. He is. Um, yeah. Sadly, there were actually two interviews with Haldeman. One of them was destroyed. Um, and there's no copy of it exists. Um, so yeah, so actually, you know, for the record, I mean, television in the 70s was generally in color, uh, but we made the choice to put it in black and white, partially as a sort of, um, as a tool to sort of structure the film and guide the viewer through the movie and help make sense of it, partially as, you know, kind of an attempt to sort of visually reference the Wizard of Oz, as it were, you know, so that black and white is the sort of the public world and the color is the private world of Nixon's staffers and I, I like to say you know, as it's interesting I think when you watch the movie at the beginning of the Nixon administration there's a sense that the self-perception and the public perception are relatively close together um, so like even Dan Rather is saying relatively concrete things at the end of Nixon's first year in office but gradually as the film progresses as the administration moves through time, especially as, it, you know, the 72 campaign wraps up and the various scandals relating to Watergate become more uh, prominent, you hopefully start to feel the internal narrative and the external narrative pulling farther and farther apart. The greater divergence between... Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And then we use these kind of post hoc interviews with Haldeman or like Brennan Chapin as a way of enabling them to reflect on their experiences and provide some you know, additional context for the viewer to understand kind of who they were, what they were thinking at the time, and sort of how they justified or rationalized it themselves, their own decisions and their own their own behavior. There were some variants and there seemed like there was even some variants over time depending on like when they did the interview and how they oh, still approached I think I think absolutely these issues. And, and really one of the one of the hardest things and to, to return to something you said earlier, one of the most difficult things we found was to convey a meaningful sense of how these three people felt about Nixon. Because the reality was that prior to Watergate, no one was really interested in personal thoughts of Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin. So there's no, there was no record, or there's only a very limited record, you know, a brief moment from like a, pre, like a committee to reflect the president, uh, made in 71 or something, 
where you know Jalen's talking about the president and so on, which you know, I think helps a little bit. But post Watergate, right? Um, no one was asking Haldeman. So you know, why did you think Nixon was so great? Why did you want to work for him? You know, what did Nixon's policies mean to you? I mean, they were asking, "Tell us about Watergate. Tell us about Watergate. Tell us about Watergate." So you know, you get a lot of Watergate and not a whole lot of anything else. So it was a real struggle to make the film not a Watergate film, which wasn't you know, obviously you can't leave it out because it's such a key part of the legacy of the Nixon presidency and of, you know, Nixon's relationship to his staffers. I mean, all three of these people went to prison for Watergate-related activities. Uh, Chapin actually had no relationship to Watergate at all. He was gone, um, but was involved in other kind of dirty tricks campaigns uh, prior to the campaign. Now, you do have a, you do have, a, I think one of the most visually interesting parts is, uh, I guess we're getting into the, uh, we're getting into the subject matter. Um, now, which is fine, I think. Um, but um, you do incl- include a fairly substantial portion on China, which mm-hmm. has a lot of actually really interesting footage. Of yeah, and, and there's a lot more. There's a shot so much film in China, and it's really cool stuff. I mean, this is like the first time Western people in this number have been to China really in many, many and the images that they yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult are. to like, and, and it, it's difficult to convey to. Um, I mean, it, it's difficult for a modern audience to understand the extent to which China was completely, to borrow a phrase, walled off yeah. from uh, the rest, from the, especially the United States, but really from the international community yeah. as a whole, and the, yeah, the novelty. You could of, easily, um, you could easily China. make an entire film of just Nixon. His trip to China and the journalists are I, mean, I, I think it could actually be a really fascinating movie if anyone wants to do it. Um, there's actually a huge collection of outtakes um, filmed by various White House agencies and so on at the Nixon Library that, as far as I'm aware, no one has ever really delved into before, and it could make for a really cool movie because there's a lot of interesting stuff and it's such a rich story and people who is such a coup mm-hmm. for the Nixon, for that Nixon was able to do that, and you know to see all of these media personalities there, and like, uh, and there's just a lot of great moments. You know, to see William F. Buckley like on T- in Tiananmen Square, you know, right. it's really right. No, that was fantastic. <laughs> was like, is that William F. Buckley? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Really and Helen Thomas. Helen right. Thomas makes several appearances in the movie. She always <laughs> seems to be around. You can pick her out by her her red dress. <laughs> right. right now. You there there is some Vietnam content, but it, I mean there's not a lot yeah. of Vietnam content. And was mm-hmm. that you know sort of a tactical decision, or um, was there just not a lot of like really great conversations that were really applicable? Or? Um, I, I mean you know it's a, it's a relatively short film. It's 85 minutes long. Uh, you have to make some decisions. You have to make decisions about what you're going to cover and to what kind of extent you're going to cover it, mm-hmm. and. Obviously, Vietnam was a huge part of, especially the first term of the Nixon presidency, most part of the second term, what existed in the second term as well. Um, And we tried to convey the extent to which that it was a defining element in Nixon's decision making, where he was directing his attention during his first term. but I mean, obviously, it's a, it, a presidential kind of administration, and especially one as that came at such a kind of pivotal point in history as Nixon's. It, it, there's just too much stuff, right? There's too much stuff to cover. You can't possibly get into everything in any kind of meaningful, deep way. Um, I mean, I always just say to people, like, look, you, you know, the thing you learn when you're making a documentary film is that. If you're really efficient and careful, you can fit about as much factual information, like actual knowledge, factual knowledge into a documentary film as you can get from like a short form New Yorker article, right. right? Max, right. max, nothing more than that, right? Um, films do something else well, I think, which is to give people a, a visual sense and an auditory sense of what... Um, of what 
people were experiencing what it was like to be in a particular place. So they convey a different kind of information, but that kind of nuts and bolts, what happened when, that's not what really documentary films are, are good at. And the more you try to do that, the less effective, ultimately, I think a lot of films end up being. So I'm always kind of depressed and amused when I hear people, you know, extemporize about a subject that and when it becomes clear to me that the only reason they know anything about this at all is that they saw something. I saw a Daryl War documentary. I saw a documentary. I'm like, well, you know, a documentary ought to be spurring you to look into something. But you shouldn't tell yourself, you shouldn't convince yourself and believe that you've somehow become an expert because you watch a 90 minute movie. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm interested. So, one of my. One of, uh, Elgin co co-bloggers is a guy named uh, Scott Eric Cosmo, uh -huh. and he does a lot of work on visual rhetoric, and uh, of course podcast uh, viewers are going to, because he does a lot of work specifically with sort of how Game of Thrones works with visual rhetoric, and, stuff. Uh -huh. and so um, hopefully, I don't know if he's already watched it, but hopefully he'll have a, an opportunity at some point. I mean, he will certainly have an opportunity because it's coming out, it's on CNN. Yeah. And I wonder if Scott will have the opportunity to comment at some point. Yeah. Because, you know, I, when, when you were talking about um, sort of setting apart the um, news footage in a certain way from the Super 8 footage and the later interview footage, sort of echoes of uh, the arguments he's made about the display of uh, information in particular ways in the relationship with the audience. Yeah, I mean, if that's his interest, I think he'll find this film interesting. I mean, it's, a, it's just objectively, I think, kind of an unusual movie. Um, I mean, there is kind of a small subgenre right now of, um, of documentary films that are based all or almost all on uh, archival footage. So, you know, films like Senna, which came out a little while ago with the like, Brazilian race car driver, or um, Black Power Mixtape, which is based on the Swedish uh, television movie came and filmed uh, the Black Power movie in, in the States in the 60s, uh, or um, Let the Fire Burn. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard it's great, which is about the, um, the firebombing the move uh, headquarters in Philadelphia. So you know, there's there's a certain number of kind of more recent films that are that are using only archival and new material in this in similar kinds of ways. And then there's sort of a history of people like Camille D'Antonio doing similar yeah, kinds exactly. uh, of work. Um, but it, it you know, I think this the film we made is a complicated one because it draws on a lot of very different sources uh, that have very different kind of visual rhetoric. You know, so home movies feel very different from network news, feel very different from staged interviews and so on. And um, and so it was a real struggle to uh, develop a coherent voice for the film to sort of integrate all these elements. It took a really long time. I mean, we owe a lot to our, our editor, Francisco Bello, who's really a genius. So, in terms of, um, more in terms of the specific subject, matter, the, the part of the film that seems to have resonated the most with people, and I believe it was, it's been referenced in, in several places where I've it, um, is the excursion that Nixon makes into, Nixon and his aides make into the history of homosexuality, right, and, oh, yeah. and state treatment of homosexuality. I mean, yeah. Was this something, was this tapes you were aware of and always planned to use, or... Yeah, um, yeah, we know, as you know... sort of grasp the comic potential of this particular... <laughs> there is a lot of Nixon tapes that have some significant comic potential, to be honest. Um, well, a fair amount of the Kissinger stuff also. Yeah, so the Kissinger stuff is hilarious. And, you know, oh, it was a, Henry is a much better looking person in, the, in 1970, which is not to say he's very good looking. Yeah, but he's, well, he's just got such a great voice, yes. right? His conversations with Nixon are just... Gold, you know. I mean, there's again, there's a there's a huge amount of material to mine there, and right. you know, we just had to force ourselves not to make Kissinger a bigger character in the film because he's just so endlessly fascinating, uh, but was not the focus of the movie, you know. And the, we had to really cut that back quite a bit. Um, so you know, as you know, there's thousands of hours of Nixon tapes, more than you know, practically that you can really um, manage. So. You know, one way we went about kind of identifying things that we were using was to see what tapes people chose to um, digitize and put on YouTube. Um, 
to kind of sh we we allowed the crowd mm -hmm. as it were right, right. to hunt out a lot of the best material for us and so you know that um, the Archie Bunker tape was very much uh, that we discovered oh, right. and and that, the like, excursion the excursion into television criticism yeah. and cultural oh, criticism God. well my fav my Which favorite just... moment my favorite moment one of my favorite lines in the movie is when Nixon says that um, you know Aristotle. And Socrates were fags, <laughs> and uh, Ehrlichman responds, but they never had the influence to tell me. And I just, I mean, I know what he means. <laughs> I know what he means, but I find it very amusing that one can say with a straight face that Socrates and Plato never had the influence of Archie Bunker and Walter Cronkite. Yeah, well, you know. No, and it's fascinating because there is something intelligible. Yeah, I guess, yeah. It. It's an yeah. intelligible, I mean, norm normally debatable are, argument. Normally, right? you ought to be very proud. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there, it's, a, it's a pretty, pretty choice mm -hmm. sequence. And, you know, we debated whether or not to use it because, you know, it doesn't really get to anything in the story. It doesn't drive the narrative forward. You know, it's sort of this excursion. But it's evocative. But it's really evocative of, of and, and you might, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the, the work of uh, Rick Prostein. Um, oh, yeah. Nixon, right? yeah. And it's conversations like that that make Nixon land make sense, right? And so, yeah. um, sort of that cultural element is as important to the phenomenon and existence of Nixon as you know, policy, you know, policy, policy absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that I, I think ultimately our feeling was that a, as you say, that tape very much sort of rem we needed to remind the audience who Nixon's kind of what Nixon's America was and how it thought and kind of one way among many in which it was different from kind of our assumptions today. I think it also um, that particular conversation is very evocative of the way that Nixon spoke to his staff members and the way he interacted with them. And so it was helpful in terms of sort of framing their relationship to each other, which is a really important part of, of the movie. But I'm glad you brought up Pearlstein, because his, his book was, was really um, influential in our thinking about how to approach the movie, um, especially because he did such a bang-up job of explaining why America was, so many Americans were so scared of the radical left in the late 60s and early 70s, and how that kind of fear drove Nixon's kind of landslide victory in, in 72. And in, in fact, in some ways, we joked even. Pearlstein did such a good job of explaining how terrifying the the radical left was in the sixties. It, it can be hard not to feel like, gee, maybe I would have <laughs> voted for Nixon in seventy two. I mean, people no, were, I would have been part of the thirty three percent that voted from a governor or something yeah. along those lines. These months. people yeah. were crazy. They really were. You know, I mean, it, it, to understand the kinds of things that the weather people and so on were engaged in, to really feel what that was. I mean, it, it's hard to fathom. That something like that we're, we're, could happen. We're, we're so far outside of the era of left-wing terrorism in the United States yeah. that it's um, it's difficult for it to be intelligible yeah. to us. Um, That's right. In the, in but the it was very left-wing related terrorism. Yes. Right? You know, whether you treat something like Charles Manson as left-wing terrorism is debatable, but yeah. certainly people at the time drew this blanket yeah. association. Yeah. And it was right? very salient for people. Right. I mean, and, and I, I can't help but believe that that's part of what they were reacting to. I mean, how else to explain the fact that despite legalizing, you know, changing the voting age from 21 to 18, Nixon still won in this massive, massive landslide. Um, now, speaking of the relationship between Nixon and Grace, one of, uh, another one of my favorite bits is, and I, is he's talking, I can't remember who he's talking with on the tapes, but... He just tells his A just an abject lie and is called out on it. Um, and something like, well, I don't think I was aware of that. Yeah. Who was it? Who, and it was He's talking to Ehrlich. Ehrlich, but Ehrlich says, yeah. we had this conversation last week, yeah. or something along those lines. Yeah. But And then Nixon just mm -hmm. yeah, well, stops. The, yeah, see, at, at the time, and, and Ehrlich kind of gets into this in, in, in the film to some extent, kind of setting the stage, as it were. But at the time, um, he didn't know 
that there was a taping system. Um, you know, only a small number of people, uh, Haldeman, uh, the president, uh, Butterfield, who kind of was involved in setting it up, you know, only a small number of people knew that uh, the taping system existed at all. And so, at least one supposition that Arlington makes is that Nixon was kind of speaking for the record, as it were, trying to insulate himself from charges that he was aware of the particular events. And, you know, he, it, it's hard to know where Nixon's mind was, as, as Erlewin points out, but, you know, obviously Erlewin couldn't play along because he didn't know that there was a taping system that was recording him. But, you know, I, 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 and, and, and one thing I like to kind of, I like to remind people of or emphasize is that, um, you know, yes, Nixon was involved in um, bugging a lot of third parties and bugging journalists, bugging the Joint Chiefs of Chaff staff, this kind of thing. So there were a lot of sort of surveillance recordings, as it were. Um, but I think people apply that kind of uh, label much too broadly. Um, the vast majority of uh, uh, secret White House tapes are tapes that Nixon was making of himself, right? He was taping his own conversations, right? He actually had a locator on him, and the system, you know, there's there's one common feature of every Nixon tape, and that's that every, every one of the secret White House tapes, and that's that Nixon is speaking on the tape, right? So, you know, yes, a lot of the recordings of David were illegal in the sense that they were Fourth Amendment violations, people's phones and so on, but um, at least under mo most or many state laws, um, the secret White House tapes were not legal. It's legal to tape record conversations that you're a party to in most places. So, um, you know, it, there's a range of different activities that, that the Nixon administration Involved in, um, but I think, and it was, I think sometimes sometimes the, it was also not the first administration to, to sort of. Oh no, 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 no! The first administration to tape them at such, so so enthusiastically. Well, it was just different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, actually, it, it, interestingly, um, so Johnson had a taping system, um, which he used sporadically, and the tapes were available uh, at the Johnson Library. Um, when Nixon took office, he actually removed the Johnson taping system. Um, and it wasn't until he became close with Johnson himself that, at least among other people, uh, Johnson encouraged Nixon to reinstall the taping system. You know, it's hard to know precisely why he chose to do it, but you know, one reason was to document his interaction with Kissinger in order to substantiate that Nixon himself was responsible for the foreign policy decisions that his administration was making, as opposed to, to Kissinger. Um, but the big difference between the Johnson and the Nixon tapes was that uh, the Johnson taping system, as well as that of previous presidents, was one that could be turned on and off. Um, but Nixon's system was voice activated because his aides were afraid that he would forget to turn it on and off. So they just made it automatic instead. They were they they didn't trust his technological uh, prowess. Um, now that said, you know Johnson did choose sometimes to take conversations that one is puzzled why he would have thought of <laughs> <laughs> Memorialization, right, as it right, were. Right. There's a very, very humorous call in which Johnson is talking to his tailor about um, ordering new pants and how he wants them to fit, and specifically so that they don't pinch the area between his scrotum and his bunghole. Um, <laughs> um, it's it's truly priceless. Um, Securing the president's table. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so That's going to be a sound bad. I'm not entirely sure why Johnson chose to <laughs> chose to take that. I think it may have been an error. Um, but, uh, but you know, obviously there's a lot more Nixon material than there is for any other president. And, of course, nothing like that will ever exist again. So, um, is there anything uh, that you're surprised nobody's really picked up on yet that you thought people were going to really think about and, you know, there, there hasn't ever really noticed or... Yeah, well, so there's, there's a moment uh, after the leak of the Pentagon Papers um, where uh, we use a conversation where uh, Nixon is talking to Kissinger, among other people, about Ellsberg, who they suspected correctly was the leaker at the time. And um, Ellsberg, of course, was uh, Kissinger's protege. 
Um, and Kissinger is talking about him and says, you know, Ellsberg, you know, before he became this crazy peacenik, he was, you know, gung-ho for the war, and he went to Vietnam and was sh essentially shooting civilians mm -hmm. willy-nilly. Um, I remember it was like he shot everyone in black pajamas. Because on the they theory were, that they the were Viet Cong Vietnam. or something, um, which is an incredibly scurrilous... I mean, basically he's accusing Ellsberg of committing war crimes, um, which, I, I mean, I have no reason to believe it's necessarily true, right? I mean, I have no basis to evaluate, but I, I'm just surprised. A, I was surprised that no one had... I mean, I looked around and didn't find anyone who talked about that well, accusation research that I had never seen before. Um, and I was just surprised no one had brought that up because, I mean, that's a really kind of um, serious accusation, frankly, um, which, you know, if it's not true, I would love, you know, Ellsberg to, to say that, you know, right. because it, it's pretty bad. Right, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's uncertain whether it's a, um, you know, just sort of a, for internal consumption, a way to make, um, to make, and especially the interpretation of Ellsberg as mentally ill, which is something that the administration certainly pushed, and it, yeah. this was a way of framing for themselves that mm -hmm. this guy is clearly mentally ill, He's yeah. a, he murders yeah, but of course, at, at the forth, time, but... you know, Kissinger certainly didn't know about the taping system. So right. this is something he was saying to Nixon in the belief that it was relevant information right. for Nixon. Now, again, like I say, I mean, just because Kissinger said it doesn't mean it's true. Um, doesn't mean he even believed it, right? Doesn't mean he even believed it himself. Right. You know, I mean, it's really impossible to say without more information. Um, but it's interesting, anyway. And I, I was just shocked that no one had mentioned it yet. I mean, people talk, you know, everyone seems really like the, you know, the Carol Faraci moment where, you know, she, you know, breaks in, interrupts the sort of the singing to, you know, right. to say, God bless Daniel Ellsberg and stop bombing right. in, in Vietnam, which is a great moment, obviously. I mean, really a fantastic kind of intervention. And then they just continue, right? And they just, sure. they just keep going. Um, yeah, and it's just weirdly been forgotten in this, in this way. Um, you know, it was kind of a big deal at the time. Um, but it's been sort of lost to the winds of history. Um, and actually, one of the funnier things, we didn't manage to work this in the, into the film, but it would have been fun if we could have, was that um, I believe later that night or the next day, um, Nixon is, I believe, talking to Haldeman about this event, and he just can't get off the subject of how hot she was. <laughs> How did you not work that out? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty great. Um, That's fantastic. But we had to move on. Right. Yeah. So another part of the material which you know I found uh, you know fascinating in contrast to um, I guess the way we've been led to think about presidential decision making in the very recent past. They, you, there is a long sequence where they refer to a speech that the president just gave, and of course they were the speech. You know, I talked to, talk to the other person, the people in the cabinet. Your other employees also think that this was a fantastic speech, etc., etc. Um, but there was a, a, a sort of a fascinating obsession with elite media opinion that seems, um, well, it seems in tension with sort of two ways in which we've come to view, right, that they, what they're not referring to is like a, a Gallup Insta poll, right, mm -hmm. which would be the immediate, if, if the president gives a speech, we would all immediately be interested in the Gallup Insta, in the Insta polling on it. We might be interested in the Twitter reaction, mm -hmm. the hair that was having a hashtag or something along those lines. Um, but it also ran counter to, uh, there, there was such an obsession with elite media opinion that is fascinating in context of a lot of the hostility that Nixon had towards this establishment of the opinion, right? Yeah. So, but that he really, really wanted to know what these people at the New York Times and everyone else. Yeah, was you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, I feel, and this is you know, this is not a scholarly opinion, but more of just a kind of an impression. But it's hard not to feel like Nixon was kind of his own enemy own worst enemy when it came to the press. I mean, when you look at the press surrounding the beginning of the Nixon administration, uh, I mean, objectively speaking, I thought it was pretty favorable, to be honest. Um, but he was always hostile and skeptical and, you know, 
didn't trust the press. You know, and I imagine at least part of that was sort of learned experience. You know, he hadn't had the best experience in the past <laughs> with the press. Um, and I'm sure that affected his ability to sort of be objective. I mean, he always had a degree it. of success in, in manipulating the press, right? Yeah. I mean, the Trekker speech remains this yeah. sort of very this magnificent way of... Right. Um, very effective. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's I, it, it's just, I, I feel like he came in, you can't help but feel like he came into the presidency with a sort of chip on his shoulder when it came to the national media, and because of that, he wasn't able to see objectively how he was being framed. I, I think that that was not necessarily to his benefit. Now, that could be a misimpression as well, but that's certainly... That was the experience that we had, um, I think, making the film. Um, it's interesting what you say about that conversation. So we did notice that pretty much every time Nixon gave a speech, certainly a major speech, he would have a very long debriefing with with Haldeman. So you know, in the film, it's you know a few minutes. In reality, this was hours. Call, call back circle around, collect more information, have another call, it would last late into the night. You know, this is a very long discussion. And they had a similar kind of arc of, you know, I was great, wasn't I? Oh, but what did everyone think? Oh, I don't care about them, I don't care about them. And at the end, it would be like, oh, geez, you know, it's like the everything's terrible and, you know, it wasn't really that good after all, you know. And it's very the same arc over and over and over again. And I think, you know, we focused on that because it was such, it was so characteristic of Nixon's relationship to his staff and sort of how he used them personally, right, as a sounding board, as people to sort of be there as he ruminated. I don't think it necessarily, I'm not sure it made it into the movie, but you know, we had a clip for a long time of, of Ehrlichman characterizing, uh, kind of interacting with the president. Said it was like Nixon was like his cut, you know, just couldn't let go. You talk things through kind of interminably, hours and hours and hours of discussion before he would make a decision. You definitely get that impression when you listen to the tapes. There's a lot of this kind of returning to the same idea over and over and over again. Which may have been characteristic of his you know, sort of particular way that he made a decision. Yeah. Made a decision. Um, so Getting out of the subject matter, the reception has been very positive. I mean, it seems to me from everything that I've read, with some, with a few notable exceptions. So, like, who to start on that? Because I think this is a more. So, why do people love your movie so much? <laughs> yeah, of uh, the people who hate your movie, why do they hate it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, the film's done really, really well with um, film critics. Right, so people who you tend to write about New York elite opinion. Yeah, right. Like people who tend to write about kind of theatrical movies mm -hmm. really seem to get it, especially people who write about documentary. Um, and I, I think you know there are reasons for that. Um, and additionally, a lot of kind of left-oriented commentators seem to really like it. Um, why? Because not the, the far left people are mad because there aren't enough. You know, there's no revelations mm -hmm. about Nixon. Like, Sorry that we didn't have any revelations to make other than, you know, the kind of more human, um, contextual, kind of trying to think about Nixon and his staffers as people and understand them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's not about revealing information or something like that. It's not really not the movie we're interested in making. So if you're looking for that, it's not the movie right. for you, per se. Um, but, I, you know, I think those two crowds of people have been very receptive. Um, Television critics, I think, have had a harder time with the movie, perhaps because it's just a really unfamiliar form for them, and their expectations are different. So the, I think there's a real schism right now in the documentary world between people who are sort of in this older kind of 60s, 70s, 80s vision of documentary film that conceptualizes documentary as kind of advocacy, social action, 
um, kind of fact delivery mechanism, <laughs> as it were, um, and a kind of more contemporary, um, more aesthetic, more um, artistically engaged sort of documentary filmmaking that you know sees nonfiction film or documentary film as sort of just another way of engaging with um, storytelling and, and image making. Um, so film critics, I think, are more familiar with that. Television critics, maybe not so much. And so on a few occasions, it's been a little harder, I think, for them to make sense of the movie and, and what it's doing and why it's structured the way that it is. Um, obviously, the other crowd of people who have had some trouble with the movie have been um, that peculiar brand of Nixon loyalists who will just they remain committed to Nixon and I you know I find it fascinating I I don't really understand them in the kind of contemporary political social landscape and it's a very interesting you know like for example you know Ben Stein and others right. being angry that the movie mentions water <laughs> essentially and I kind of feel like well you know, you know I, I mean you kind of can't help it right I mean and to say like well you know you don't touch on all the great things that Nixon did like, well you know it's a short film right we did actually I think include in the film as much as we could like practically speaking of Nixon's successes you know you see Apollo you see Nixon ending the war in Vietnam you see Nixon going to China you see here Ehrlichman talking about domestic policy reforms etc 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 you know I mean did we leave some stuff out yeah I mean you know like the salt treaty didn't make it in there you know there were lots of other diplomatic trips that didn't make it in there you know revenue sharing is missing but um <laughs> but you know we tried you know to the extent that it was possible to work that material in there um you know, is there a lot of Watergate? Well, yeah, but, you know, Watergate kind of defined Nixon's second term, like it or not. It's the reason people are going to remember yeah. Nixon well, 100 years from now. No right? one's coming to watch the movie to learn about Nixon's successes, right? The reason people are interested in a movie based on the home movies of Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin is that Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin went to prison for Watergate, right? That's why people want to see the movie. So, I mean, you know, you... That's that what gets him. That's what gets him in the door. You have to grapple with the story, and frankly, you can't tell their story without telling the story of Watergate. Because among other things, Watergate is a story of how President Nixon threw these guys under the bus in order, you know, to hopefully save himself. And it's, and relatively, it didn't it's relatively apparent in there. That, you know, the, the earlier focus on them, uh, their you know their relationship with him, mm -hmm. their, their affection for him, and so forth. You know, has this, a poignancy because it becomes so clear as you go that Nixon is really ending his relationship with them in order to protect himself, to make every effort to protect That's himself. Right. And so even though, I mean, you really do kind of end the movie with them, and then there's just sort of, you know, what are effectively yeah. you know, title cards after that. But um, uh, but that actually works very well because it's, it's, it's sort of a movie about their relationship, and you can't tell the story of their relationship without explaining how their relationship ended. It's like, <laughs> I was married once and I'm not anymore. So, <laughs> so let's talk about just the married part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's yeah. an interest, obviously, in, in doing that, but it's only... Yeah. I think you, you have to understand the good years in order for Watergate to actually make sense as well. So I, mean, I think that's the mistake that people made. It's like you can't have one without the other, as you say. You know, I mean, the movies that just focus on Watergate, I think, are confusing because... Watergate didn't happen in a vacuum, you know, and I don't think you can understand Watergate without at least trying to understand the people who were involved in it in kind of a broader context. Uh, but at the same time... And not to mention the sense of domestic paranoia, yeah. too, that kind of pervades the, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we felt like... And ultimately, I think the, the film is pretty balanced in terms of sort of where... What, what they're talking about. I mean, yes, the second half of the film is a lot heavier on Watergate, but you know, it also covers the campaign and a lot of other stuff as well. So, so um, I guess, is there a next thing? Do you have any thoughts about what you're going to do in the future? 
Well, Penny is is working on a new film called Nuts, uh, which is going to be kind of an animated quasi documentary about a uh, quack doctor from the 1920s who claimed to cure impotence by transplanting goat testicles into men's scrotums. Um, I'm and then, already intrigued. <laughs> and then he, for reasons I'm not going to go into. Right he now, went on to almost become governor of Kansas and uh, created border radio as well. Basically, invented border radio and introduced um, country western music to the general public in America. Um, so it, it it's going to be. I think it's going to be great. It should be very very fun. Um, but I haven't read the script and whatnot. It's, it's pretty fantastic. Um, and uh, I'm working on a new project, another archival project as well, which hopefully I'll be able to um, launch publicly pretty soon. Um, so I'm looking forward to that sometime in the next couple of months. Well, wonderful. So, uh, everyone, thank you for uh, having uh, either listened in or watched or both uh, uh, over the course. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, talk again. So, cool. Thanks a lot, Rob. It's been fun.